I am that. And he was had a stall in Bombay selling handmade cigarettes. One would have thought, this is not very good karma, you're making other people ill. <laughs> and he smoked quite heavily, apparently. And he just visited a guru, a teacher, who said, well, just remember that you are consciousness. Just be aware of the the I am, in whatever you do, feel yourself as consciousness. Oh, okay. And then he went off back to his daily business and he applied. Can, can we call that a technique? It's too simple to be called a technique. All he was, he remembered is, I'm consciousness. And he felt, attempted to feel the, the I the deeper I that underlies all experiences, awareness itself. And a few years later, it had emerged fully. It didn't come all at once, but it didn't take very long. And then suddenly he started speaking wisdom. A cigarette seller, almost illiterate, Suddenly, people would come and ask him questions and intensely alive and wise answers came out of his mouth. Something had come through the form and so the cigarette seller became Nisargadatta Maharaj. In India they like giving people names. Maharaj means the great king, spiritually, of course. <laughs> so this is a, one a teacher to whom it came not suddenly, although it didn't take very long. But after a few years, it became a continuous living presence. Presence was continuous in him. Now, as it is becoming a more widespread phenomenon, and this is happening, many people experience at first as a lessening of suffering, a considerable lessening of suffering in their lives. They can breathe, there's some space. There may still be drama occasionally, but there's space also. To many people it is coming gradually and to others it is coming in an accelerated form. In this culture, these days, it often happens through an illness, AIDS, cancer. And I know quite a few to whom it came in that way and I could see and I told them you are on an accelerated course what otherwise probably would have taken much much longer is happening now through your illness that is forcing you into presence and others don't need an illness it's happening I cannot tell you whether you are better off with an illness or without it. If you choose presence, and this is only a limited perspective, it's not the ultimate truth, then it's less likely that you'll need to be hit over the head in order to crack the remaining shell. If you die to the past, every moment and return to just the freshness of this. Don't carry personal past, the past in relationships, the past that you have with people. Yesterday they said that or whatever. Meet a person as if for the first time, look at them 
and be there as a presence, not as a heavy personal past. Be the attention, be the attention that is looking at them, because that's what you are. Be the consciousness that flows through your eyes as you look at them and listen to them. You are that. And then you the beautiful expression in the Course in Miracles that is used for the present moment is the holy instant. To realize the only place that is sacred in life is this moment. If you only pay attention to it, you notice the sacredness of whatever form it takes, even if it looks horrible at first, because what looks horrible at first will be some kind of death some kind of breaking down, and there also is sacredness. We already pointed to that, particularly there. How can I get over or release the outrage I, among others, feel about the political situation in the United States? Bush and his policies, which led to the invasion of Iraq, the dismantlement of the US social services and civil liberties. Should I really let go, release this outrage? Outrage, I assume, is a kind of anger. There are many places where you can look in this world. Countries, places, institutions, governments. And you see varying degrees of human unconsciousness at work. Wherever you look, you see the manifestation of human unconsciousness. Unconsciousness, of course, I'm not saying they are totally as... They are identified with the, the mind and the old patterns of the mind, the collective ego. And wherever you look still, you see it, because the change that is happening in humanity, to a large extent, is on the inner. It only slowly reaches the outer levels where you can actually detect it. It takes a while before it reaches an institution, before it reaches a politician, before it reaches somebody in a position of power, but occasionally it already happens. Russia had a relatively enlightened human being after having had succession of um, leaders who seemed you didn't even know whether they were alive or dead when you saw them when they were having their, <laughs> their and there were there was actually speculation <laughs> there was. Is whoever the, like Brezhnev or whoever the names were, is he still alive or did they just put a puppet there that went? <laughs> and some others speculated that there was an, it was an actor acting because they didn't dare say that he had died, so they they gave an actor the role to play, and this maybe have been true, we don't know. And that's one form of unconsciousness, and the entire 
the structure of that regime was started from from an ideal. The mind saw something beautiful. Uh, we must have equality. No personal possessions. But nothing had changed in the human mind. The structures were still in place, so we got that instead. And then suddenly there was Gorbachev, who compared to the previous leaders, was a Buddha in consciousness. <laughs> I remember once a remark he made on television when he was still president. They asked, there was a little scandal about sp some Western spies and Eastern spies had been thrown out of the country. Some, the usual thing. And what about this scandal about the Russian spies in the Russian embassy? And, and he said, well, as the wise man said, this too will pass. <laughs> and it did. However, it is rare for this shift that is happening in human consciousness to reach the outer forms, the institutions, the political, the government, the institutions, whatever it may be, the outer forms, business, businesses, the way businesses are run, companies. In most cases, they're dominated still by the old egoic consciousness. And I've spoken to some people who, are, who work in corporations, who say there's so much infighting and useless power struggles going on within the corporation, it's a miracle that anything gets done at all. And everybody lives in fear and they're not happy. So wherever you look in the world, you will find still on the surface of things varying degrees of unconsciousness. And only occasionally something else comes through already here and there. It does. Even on television, sometimes you see it. You see there's some a conscious being speaking or a conscious a film that has a message pointing to conscious awareness or pointing to stillness it happens maybe it happens more now it's happening more it's always wonderful i love it when i see a film that points to the truth and there are quite a few now not the majority yet of course but there are so many things that you could feel angry about if you personalize human unconsciousness. If you make it into an identity, then you say, these dreadful bastards, look what they are doing. <laughs> human unconsciousness. Jesus saw it clearly when he said, they know not what they do. In other words, they are unconscious. And so a country sometimes also can vary. A country can be pulled into unconsciousness to some extent by an unconscious leader. Germany is a best example of what happened there. A country that, compared to others on the planet, was one of the most highly developed cultured science scientifically literature, culture, philosophy, music, and all that to no avail. They dropped right down into unconsciousness. <laughs> Back. But this wouldn't have happened if there had not been a strong, enormous amount of collective pain body still in the country. And an enormous amount of collective ego despite the so-called cultural achievements. So when you see it as unconsciousness, you are less likely to feel angry about it because anger does not really fulfill a very useful purpose. It doesn't really change things. It contributes 
more you're being pulled into unconsciousness through anger, you become unconscious yourself. See it for what it is. And then the next step is what can you do? You have to accept that this is so, which does not mean there's nothing you can do. Once you have accepted that there's still a considerable amount of unconsciousness here on the planet, wherever you see it, wherever you feel it's mostly, you feel called upon to do something in this or that area. It could be the destruction of nature. It could be the polluting of oceans and rivers. It could be on the political scene, American politics, other politics, Middle East, great focal point of unconsciousness. It's just look at the situation there. The instinct is no stop, no pause to the fighting between the two. And they're both victims of the other. And they're both totally convinced that they're victims of the other. <laughs> so when you see it, then you can point out certain things. Write, speak to people, have a website that says the truth about such and such, so and so, and just state the facts that as they are. This is how it is. If you want to, you can stand at a street corner and hold up something, a sign. A few people may start talking to you. They are more likely to listen if you are not angry, but simply explain, look, this is how it is. They are more likely to watch your website if, they, if it doesn't have this the screaming anger about it. You're not convincing anybody who has the opposite view to yours, who says Bush is the greatest leader that has happened to America in a long time. You're not going to convince them with your anger that you are right. Anger will, their own position will become more entrenched. And so if you're right, then state the facts. This is how it is. Explain. If you can see the futility of anger, it's more likely to drop away. And there's something more powerful then. You can speak with passion, without anger, but passion, about what you feel is true. Be aware, very careful with identifying with mental positions though when you do that, identifying with a position as me or us against. Be very careful with making wrong others, groups of people or individuals, because it draws you back into unconsciousness. Don't personalize it in that way. When doing projects of any sort, large or small, I find I must keep my intent fiercely in mind or I end up doing something else. <laughs> By employing this fierce focus, am I actually being counterproductive in the long run or in the big picture? The focus, when you, are, you, are, you have a project that needs to be done, finished, now, he, you, the questioner is saying, keeping, my intent fiercely in mind. Now, in, the intent, I assume, is where you want to get to, the, the, the finished project, the, where you want to, the point that you want to arrive at, 
to get it done. So my intent is getting to that point where the project is finished. My intent is drawing up a plan, a business plan, or the, the architect does the a building, draws up a huge high-rise office building, or whatever, or there may be a project of any kind that you need to finish. There's the intent, and that's very much I compare to a journey when you're traveling from here to there, maybe you're walking, let's say the rudimentary form, the early form of journeying, of being on a pilgrimage or journeying. Tourists didn't exist at that time. It, it was unknown. The people would journey because they had to leave their country or they went on some kind of army expedition or pilgrimage, spiritual journey. That was perhaps the most common journey that individuals would undertake, it's pilgrimage. You know where you need to go. The question is, what is it that takes up most of your attention, the place that you need to get to or the step you're taking at this moment? What's more important? Now, in many cases these days, what people are obsessed with is the outcome where they need to get to, and that is that causes the stress. I need to get this done, finished, over with, and I, I'm on a limited time scale here. Can't waste any minute. It needs to get done. I need to. So there's an excessive projection to the finished end product, the, the point in the future that I need to get to. And then the doing itself, is, it is done in a hurried way. A rest, there's the energy, of, okay, come on, what's the next, uh, uh, next. It doesn't matter what you're doing, let's say you, you have to complete something that you manufacture with your hands, but this thing has to be ready by tomorrow. The world is mad these days. It always tells you that you have no time. You have to do it by tomorrow. <laughs> and so you become excessively focused on tomorrow. I have to get this, the finished product. Or the, you're thinking that I can sell this. When it's finished, I can sell it. So it's done quickly with the end in mind. The end takes over your mind occupies your mind more than the present moment and you reduce the present moment to a means to an end. That's how a lot of doing happens these days. And all that doing is of low quality. Any doing that reduces this moment to a means to an end to a future moment is not high quality doing. And you can observe that when you observe how a person works, whether they are totally attentive give total attention to whatever they are doing at this moment, which does not mean that they don't know where they are going to in their project, that is peripherally in their field of attention. The point they want to get to is peripherally in their field of attention, like a traveler who is walking towards Rome, let's say, and they are taking this step and are fully conscious of each step they are taking, but peripherally they know where they're going, it's over there, it's a long way away, a long way, but they know it's over there, so the focal point of there is the quality of your step at this moment, because if you're not careful you'll stumble, you'll never get to Rome. The quality of each step is what matters, and the getting is secondary, it is on the periphery, you have the goal in mind also, but no, it does not occupy your mind. It does not overpower you. And so then, the present moment is not a means to an end. You give your full attention to this moment. I have seen a few, not many, and some of them are highly so-called effective and successful people who did not become successful through strain and stress. Some did, and, and they are very unhappy and won't be around for long. But I have observed a few who, whoever they meet, whoever they talk to, 
or whatever is presented to them, they are totally there with it. If you come to them and ask them a question, they may be high up, so to speak, in social terms, the CEO of this or that corporation, and somebody comes to them, and there are a few, not many, who will give you total attention, no matter who you are. And that is wonderful. Everybody loves doing what they tell them to do because they feel so valued because attention is the greatest gift you can give. Full attention. You're acknowledging that human being beyond the roles that they play in the world. So they're giving everything their fullest attention and they are extremely effective at what they do. Others look as if they were effective but everything they do is contaminated with extremely stressful raw energy that is really a form of suffering and they spread unhappiness so it is possible to work effectively in fact more effectively by focusing on what it is at hand here right now to do without losing the in your peripheral vision the place you need to get to that remains here there one step Rome is there but this step is here and this step is more important whenever you see any work of quality that's been made by a human being it means some attention must have gone into it some human attention somewhere there must have been someone who did not reduce the moment in which that was being made to a means to an end where it gave so you have works of art that have that quality handicraft things made by artisans in the original way not under stress of having to produce because attention is also loving care another aspect of attention is whatever you give attention to there is a loving care that flows into the doing so if you give attention to a human being that comes into the now the field of now and this is the, so beautiful to give each human being that comes into your field of vision to you with this or that demand or question or whatever it may be give them full and complete attention that doesn't mean you get drawn into their story you don't give attention necessarily to their mind stream and energize that you give you simply give attention there's an spaciousness there is 